industry, a multi-trillion dollar industry. That, that's out there, it's not controversial for those of you who are new to the issue, it's as big as that. So we have a threat to the capital markets. Munich Re, the biggest reinsurance company in the world, talks about this in uh, its own literature. Then going quickly through the others, uh, and I'm not going to dwell on these, but I commend to you the very latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel. We're facing increased threats, obviously, from drought and flood alike and proliferation of pests to our food supplies. Uh, increased threat to water supplies because of the runoff equation. When you get a drought, you lose much more in the way of available groundwater uh, for water supplies than you do just at first blush from the drought. Um, and then the threat to human health. If you look at these four reports and look how the world's doctors have got engaged in this process, in the 1990 report, the first one, human health was barely mentioned. Uh, but in the fourth report, there are major um, sections on human health. Increased risk of conflict, hundreds of millions of refugees, how are we going to deal with that? Threat even to societal stability. How do we hold democracies together in the face of the kind of stresses we're, we're putting on things? And then in Greenpeace in 1990 at the World Climate Conference that kicked off the negotiations, I and my colleagues made a simple and obvious point. We thought it was obvious. If this had been a military threat assessment exercise, if we had been talking about the threat from the Red Army of invest, invading Europe, which of course at the time we were in the, in the middle of the Cold War, it was just coming to an end, um, was a topical thought, then we would have bought out insurance against the worst case analysis. That's what we did all those years of the Cold War. We maxed out our defense budgets to try and buy insurance to stop the Red Army, if they were ever capable of it, who knows, from invading Western Europe. Um, but with this exercise, the scientist's brief was to come up with the best guess. That was a form of words from the UN. The best guess, not the worst case. And the worst case involved the danger of amplifying feedbacks that would all gang up and, and actually lead to number 13, which is the danger of a runaway effect. So that in this worst case analysis, we heat the atmosphere so much that we start stimulating emissions from drying soils, dying forests, stratifying oceans, melting permafrost, um, and other so-called biogeochemical feedbacks that are then putting emissions into the atmosphere as it were naturally um, and causing this process to begin to get away from us so that that component that we can cut from fossil fuels becomes too great and the whole thing snowballs. Now, at that time, we were accused of scaremongering, gross scaremongering, other environment groups the same. Now, I have to tell you, if you don't know, this is common parlance in the debate from the scientists. They are too, uh, they too are worried about a runaway effect, and NASA are talking about um, just 10 years, in fact, to achieve the deep cuts in emissions that we need to escape this problem. So that is a quick, straightforward summary of global warming as I see it. Um, and I invite you not just to accept what I say, uh, but please do read the um, executive summary, the, the policy makers summary of the fourth report, if you haven't already. It's available on the website of the IPCC. It was compiled by many hundreds of scientists from all over the world. This is what governments are listening to. This is what business is increasingly listening to. And this is what we should all be listening to and basing our uh, thoughts and responses on. So, on the one hand, when I started out in this business in 1990, Time magazine and The Economist and some of the more conservative small c uh, publications were very, very sniffy about this problem. The Economist particularly. Uh, now we see some snapshots here. Time magazine from last year, be worried, be very worried, talking about the whole thing, talking in similar parlance to that which I've just used. Uh, business week, global warming, why business is taking it so seriously? We'll have a look at that in a minute because that, in my view, is really, really important. And then, of course, Al Gore's famous film, which has done so much to alert um, people around the world because of the way his film has been received. That's on the one hand. I'll give you the other hand in a minute. But why business is taking it so seriously? 
Let's have a look at this and think about this for a minute. Um, Walmart, the company that environmentalists and campaigners love to hate, and often with good reason over the years, now has a CEO, Lee Scott, who has had a personal epiphany on this problem. And it was driven by meeting during 2005 NGOs, environment group leaders, and others, and thinking through the problem, and also visiting and seeing with his own eyes the effect that Hurricane Katrina had on New Orleans. That, in his own words, I'm paraphrasing but accurately, led him to the point where he came to the conclusion that what he was being told by the White House was wrong, catastrophically wrong, and he and his company were going to do something about it. They are indeed doing something about it. They have a, a target of going zero carbon. In other words, total cuts in fossil fuels. They want all their stores all over the world to be completely powered by renewable energy. They say they don't know when they can do this by, but unlike governments, they've set an interim target. It's 20% cuts by 2010 on a whole range of other stuff. Half a billion dollars for the survival technologies, um, high fuel efficiency uh, in their fleets, and very, very critically, they are going to and have told their supply chain, there are 60,000 suppliers they have, guys, you want to supply Walmart, you're going to do exactly the same as us. Um, we need you to come with us on this uh, adventure. And we, in Solar Century, <laughs> we are effectively one of those suppliers, and we have seen the um, effect on clients of ours in, for example, building big industrial sheds, just how this is playing through. And if you contrast this to some of the behavior we see from governments, where you get good rhetoric on the one hand, but on the other, precious little in the way of policy, and I'm talking about my own government here, uh, with which to back it up. Um, Walmart store managers now are rewarded, yes, on the profitability of their store, number one, and number two, on how much carbon they save in each quarter through energy-saving measures. So, you know, we can argue in the Q&A, um, I'm sure I meet people all the time who say, you're being really naive here, Jeremy, this is just greenwashing, you are being suckered in. I don't think so. I'm not blind to the other things that are going on and some of the inconsistencies, but I think this is really meaningful and it's much more meaningful than what I see from pretty much all governments with the exception uh, of the Swedens and uh, some of the others who really are going for it. Certainly having served on the British government's Renewables Advisory Board for three years since the Energy White Paper of 2003, uh, I've become very disillusioned with um, their ability to match rhetoric with policy. Uh, and in the retail sector, others have sort of followed on, whether it's because of Walmart or, or not, I don't know, but Marks and Spencers now have a target to go carbon neutral in five years. Uh, the chief executive has said he's going to do it as much as he can with renewable energy and efficiency and only use offsetting, and it won't be offsetting with trees, it'll be offsetting with other carbon um, reduction schemes uh, and he's going to get to that target as much as he can without offsetting. Marks and Spencers too are putting pressure on their supply chain. They're not as big as Walmart. Walmart, if it was an economy, if it was a government, would be the 20th biggest government in the world. It's incredible to imagine that, but that's the fact. Um, Tesco as well have followed on. They haven't quite gone as far as as Marks and Spencers, but they're bigger. Their target is 50% reduction in emissions uh, by 2010, um, and a whole range of other measures that they put in place. So you sort of think to yourself, what, what are, what's motivating these people? They could, if they were just box ticking,